It's one of the things, um, maybe, uh, maybe don't start the recording just for a second, Hugo, because uh, it's one of the things I, I kind of regret a bit about the course here, is we used to have third year EM, and in particular a course called fourth year EM theory that was taken by uh, Richard Keesing. And um, that goes on to, you know, it basically treat the kind of thing that I'm going to have a go at in one lecture. So you've got an 18 lecture fourth year course coming up in the next couple of hours. I mean, obviously we don't need to rush it. And I'd say too, I wouldn't bother, it's up to you of course, but I wouldn't particularly bother with notes. All the stuff is up on the VLE under what's called advanced classes. You know there's a tab advanced classes and under that there's stuff about tensors, gauge theory and so on. So there won't be anything that I say today that's not already up on the VLE. So, um, you know, it, 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 but of course what I'm going to do today is a compacted form of that because there are um, several different um, talks, if you like, on it on the VLE. Okay, let's, uh, let's make a start. Um, surprise, surprise, we're starting off with um, James Clark Maxwell. And indeed, the whole business, if you like, of um, tensors, well, have a guess who was the first person to apply tensors to physical problems, and that was uh, Maxwell. And um, in a sense, uh, so much of what we know about modern physics came from when he was a, 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 a boy in Edinburgh, you know, around 1840, when he was probably seven or eight years old, and he went to see an exhibition that included what's called an Iceland spa crystal, and when you look through it, uh, you see two images, and um, he was quite fascinated by this, and it turns out, it's rather an irony, that uh, uh, although Maxwell applied tensors to the elastic properties of solids and in advanced solid state physics that's the way you handle compressions and shear stresses applied to, to crystals. Uh, it turns out to be that tensor algebra is extremely important for birefringence. Um, although I won't go into the details of that today. The, um, I, I sort of introduced the idea in a uh, qualitative way when I, there goes uh, my first prop has disappeared, when I looked at the properties of um, anisotropic materials. You know we did the, uh, the stuff on polarisation and I pointed out if you've got um, an anisotropic material like this, I mean you've only got to look at it to see that it's completely different in what's called the basal plane or we could think of the XY plane to along this axis. It's extremely easy to cleave in this plane, extremely hard, you need a pretty sharp saw to cut through it in this plane, but you can just use your, you know, your fingers to pick pieces of the crystal up, it splits very easily in this plane. And I pointed out that if you put a uh, electric field across a material like this, then clearly if you put an electric field, let's just say at an angle like that, it turns out the electrons, you wouldn't be surprised to hear, are much easier to pull uh, w uh, within the plane than they are in the so-called c-axis direction. So the polarisation vector swings compared with the electric field vector. And so it's completely obvious that when we considered those so-called linear isotropic, I'm just going to abbreviate the whole thing to alpha, you know, we, we had this with the epsilon naught in. Let's just say there is a number, uh, which is, is obviously, say a number, certainly not a scalar number, because if we were to multiply by a scalar number, the electric field would always point in the same direction as the polarisation field. So a very straightforward property of matter. We couldn't possibly explain if this thing here was a scalar. And in fact, it's a tensor. So in the first part of the lecture, I'm going to talk a bit about tensors in general. In particular, it's easier to understand tensors in 3D space than in 4D space time. So I'm going to start with the idea of, well, what's a tensor? So I'm going to use some old notes, uh, and again, these are up on the VLE. I won't bore you too much with the, uh, the notes, but it's just you know, really to remind me of where we're going. If you want to do, um, let me just pop this down a bit, a bit clearer, won't it, if we go over to, uh, yeah. So you know, if you want to um, 
go deeply in, in, into theoretical physics at an advanced level, particularly with regard to gravitation, uh, recommend uh, Lorden's book on tensor calculus. It's not by any means easy. There's a more elementary book on just on what are called Cartesian tensors, which is the only type I'll talk about today. And exactly, I've introduced this idea that this simply cannot be a scalar uh, in general because um, if we relate the uh, polarization vector to the electric field vector and it points in a different direction, we cannot have a scalar quantity uh, relating the two fields. So, in general, P will not be parallel to E. And I've got another view graph illustrating the point here. Very straightforward one. Um, <clears throat> this, this was the old, part of the old um, EM3 course that I gave a, a few years ago, so don't worry about you know, figure numbers and things like that. And uh, uh, let's just consider one plane. In the, um, in the crystal and we've got an, an E-field put across it and we've got this straightforward idea that um, we've got a, a net P-field which doesn't point in the same direction as the E-field. Now, if we put an E-field across in, let's say, the X-direction, it's kept general here, it produces polarizations in both the X and Y direction. And I mentioned that, you know, if you've got tetrahedral bonds within a solid and you try and pull the electrons along one of the axes, it produces a pull on the other axis because the, of the way the electron density is distributed in the solid. So the polarization produced, uh, and we just you know, consider this 2D uh, situation, imagine that's EX. Well, this P has clearly got X and Y components due to putting uh, a field across in X direction. And similarly, if we put a field across in Y direction, again, we've got a lot of complicated electronic interactions within the solid. It produces a polarization in both the X and the Y directions. So we've got to think of a way uh, to handle that. And the way we handle it is very straightforward that um, basically, and that this is just now in a, this old equation 8.2, generalizing the, the, that idea to three dimensions, is that you'll see this thing has, of course, this alpha now that relates the fields has got uh, a double subscript. And in particular, um, you've got uh, that you've, uh, the first subscript refu refers to the, um, <coughs> the polarization that's produced and the second subscript refers to the field that's producing it. So we get, if we put an E field along the X axis, we get polarizations along the X, Y, and Z axes. And so these constants of proportionality are just telling us how much P field we get for a given E field along the X axis, how much Y field we get for a given X axis field, and how much Z polarization we get for a given uh, x-axis field. And obviously it's, we, we have similar relationships for the fields in the y direction and for a field in the z direction. So there's our external E field in the y direction producing polarizations in all three directions. Here's our field in the z direction, second subscript, producing its polarizations in the um, X, Y, and Z directions. And of course, you know, we're physicists, so we don't like writing out tons of components all the time. We prefer a compact notation for that. So we put those three equations for the polarization field together, and we get a polarization, it's called, this thing, alpha is called the polarizability. This now is a tensor. The alpha which is given the symbol ij, where i and j run over each of the letters x, y, and z. This double subscript um, quantity is uh, basically now called the polarizability tensor. So it's quite a simple idea, but I'd just like to say, again, let me just uh, go back up to the, the lights maybe for the board for a second. Um, so what we uh, like to do is to write all this in a very kind of neat way. And what we normally do is say that P 
I'll <coughs> just go straight on to the next slide. Um, it, an obvious way of um, simply writing these in a compact notation is to say that P subscript I is equal to, and then we sum over J of alpha IJ EJ, where I is running over the index X, Y, Z. And that's a nice compact notation for this series of, 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 of three relationships, um, which we summarize in this way. And so, also, if you want to do more advanced work, there's a, a, a summation convention for tensors, which is that if any index occurs twice, you sum over it. So this is normally written in books, advanced books, in this way, where the summation is implied. It's called contraction. So this is a second rank tensor. This is a first rank tensor, aka a vector. This is a first rank tensor, aka a vector. And this quantity is a second rank tensor. We contract over these two components, uh, which implies the summation above. So that, that, that's, this is how it works in a very, very simple, obvious 3D way, where all we're doing is just relating a polarisation to an electric field. Now, um, according, you've got to, uh, when you write things out now, you, you, uh, if you write, just write out alpha xx, alpha xy, alpha x so this is often a way in which a tensor is represented alpha y x alpha y y alpha y z and then alpha z y oops excuse me alpha z x alpha z y alpha z z this thing looks like a matrix but it's not just a matrix the components have to transform into each other in a particular way when we change coordinate system and that's obviously going to be the case we know perfectly well you might choose three completely different x y and z axes in the first place and we know that physically that if you like, the real physics of the situation can't depend on our arbitrary choice of coordinate system. So these are, this is not, it looks like a matrix, and in some respects, I'm just going to you know, come to what's the, the rotation matrix, um, it behaves like a matrix. However, you've got to be aware that these are very specifically transforming according to how we choose the axes, just in the same way that vectors are. So, you know, like a, a bit of a kind of random walk. Here's a bit of the uh, first year maths course that uh, Irene set you um, as a problem. Year one, week two, summer term. You probably all remember it with great fondness. This is, if you like, a uh, simple uh, rotation matrix. And um, if you've got any view graph pens with you, yes. then you're <coughs> what you're saying with you know, this um, type of problem here, you were, you were asked to say, well, you're given this little rotation matrix here, and uh, you were applying it to this vector here, and you were asked to show that the effect of E on R would be to rotate the position vector R by theta about the origin. And here's uh, Irene's um, solution uh, to the problem. So again, it's a very straightforward idea, and uh, this is written in matrix form. I say there are some similarities and some differences between matrices and tensors. In matrix form, what we're saying is if we want the components in the new coordinate system, all we have to do is uh, simply apply this matrix to the components in the original coordinate system. And of course, we will preserve, it's perfectly obvious, it, we'd be very worried otherwise, if at the end of the day here, we didn't get the R prime squared 
is equal to r squared. Of course, we've got to preserve the physical distance between points when we do this. The components we choose are different. And to put it in posh terminology, and we'll be coming much more to the posh terminology in the second half of the lecture, uh, r in 3D space is what's called a scalar invariant. And clearly, in 3D, we can generalise this to x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. We're quite free to rotate our coordinate system, but it doesn't, let's hope, if we, do the, if we write down the matrix right and do the multiplication correctly, it won't change the distance between where I am and where you are. That, you know, I could choose my x-axis up there or up there or up there, wherever I like. The distance from me to anybody is the same. So this is, if you like, is the transformation properties. This is, the, you know, if you like, the coordinate transformation. And remember that the, this will apply, for example, you know, it applies to both the electric field vector and the position vector, is that it's pretty clear, let me use a different um, colour, that if I had an electric field measured in the original coordinate system, and that's now that's EX, and that's EY, and this is EY prime, and this is EX, excuse me, not no prime, plus EY, that the electric field must transform in that way, and the polarisation vector must transform in that way. And then that implies that we have a further transformation requirement on the tensor components. So, again, I'm only doing this, of course, you know, you know if you've learned in second year maths how to do rotations in 3D, but uh, let's just stick, if you like, what I'm looking at here is just this uh, subset. I'm looking at, if you like, yeah, if we chose to do particularly a rotation about the z-axis, uh, and we don't have to worry about the phi angle in the 3D rotation matrix. Of course, I can just write this for a rotation uh, about the z-axis. In other words, you know, it's a, it's a subset, and I'm not going to, you know, that, that, that's readily generalised. The idea that I want to get across is that because this transforms, the components of this must obey the transformation of a vector. Wouldn't be a vector otherwise, and this obeys the transformation uh, properties of a vector, the tensor components, like this alpha xx, have to also obey the same type of transformation. Uh, but it's not difficult. We know what x and y are. I've, I've scribbled over them that they could also be electric field components, they could also be polarisation field components, any vector in 3D this would apply to. Well, it's not difficult if we take the original that x prime is x cos theta minus y sine theta to work out that x prime x prime is x squared cos squared theta minus x y sine theta cos theta minus x y sine theta cos theta plus y squared theta. So that would be the way, and again, I just considered in this little example, just for the sake of, I hope, clarity, a little subset of a 3D second rank tensor. Second rank means I've got two indices. 3D is the number of dimensions in which I'm working. So this little subset would be a second rank two-dimensional tensor. The whole thing would be a second rank three-dimensional tensor. And if again, of course, I would like this to be more general, usually uh, it, it, it can be written TIJ, it often is written TIJ in um, three dimensions, but it's usually, as we'll see in the second half of the lecture, written with T nu mu when we go to four dimensions, space time. Um, that has a very simple transformation property, that if I've measured the polarizability components, so in other words, let's say I've done an experiment and I've actually measured these four things, I've put some electric fields across the crystal in the x-axis and the y-axis and I've measured the resulting polarizations and I just know these four numbers from experiment, then 
um, I can move to a different coordinate system, in other words, in this case, just rotate my coordinate system about the z-axis, and the tensor components have to transform in this way. Now, it turns out that the polarizability tensor is symmetric. And so, in that symmetric means that if you swap over the components, um, you get the same value. So, in a symmetric tensor, we immediately have, well, this xy is equal to this one. We can read these two components are equal. Similarly, xz zx, alpha zx is equal to alpha xz so we can if you like reduce the number of independent components immediately to 6 because it's a symmetric tensor given the um, physics of this particular problem and you can see that if it's a symmetric tensor of course I can write T21 is equal to T12 and write my tensor component in a rotated coordinate system easily. Just, you know, like code squared, we know what angle we've twisted the axes by, and if we've measured the tensor component uh, along original x and y axes, and then we rotate by theta about the z axis, we can easily calculate the new component. And of course we can do it for all nine. That's not a problem. But, you know, it's to be aware when you first see the tensors, in a physical seat, I know you did a bit on them in the in the maths course this year. You're talking about an object that changes. You say, like, uh, I mean, if I just write up, you know, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's a perfectly good matrix, but the components of this don't change as I change coordinate system. They're just numbers. So tensors are much more uh, specific than. Um, the, um, uh, <coughs> the, the, the matrices that they look like. Okay, well, you've been dealing with an anti-symmetric second rank three-dimensional tensor solidly for about probably three or four years, if you, if you learn the cross product that long ago. Certainly uh, from last year, if you hadn't done the cross product before the, uh, the Maths 1 course. And this is something that I think I mentioned at the time, almost as a footnote. I've dug out some of, one of the, gosh, this will take you back. Remember the days when you could get marks in exams for getting a cross product of two vectors. It's all gone horribly difficult since, but uh, those were the good old days. But I did mention, even at the time, as a kind of flag for the future, that a cross product is a slightly weird kind of vector because if you take A cross B you get a different answer to when you take B cross A and specifically as you know B cross A is minus A cross B and this is uh, pointed out uh, that the cross product is what's called an axial vector now we're going to develop things the B field, the magnetic field, is an axial vector, and the E field is what's called a polar vector. And a polar, for a polar vector, it doesn't matter whether I take a right or a left-handed coordinate system, I get the same components. But if I change the left to a right-handed coordinate system with an axial vector, I get negative results. So there's obviously something different about the two kinds of object. And I think that's easier to, easiest to show in a physical situation if um, you consider a rotating object. And again, this, we, we use this view graph a bit in um, looking at the uh, <coughs> Stokes theorem, you know, when we were looking at you know, the implication of what circulation of a field would be, and I mentioned that a rotating disk has z the velocity, the vector field, has a uh, non-zero uh, cross product, but uh, <coughs> a zero divergence, because the atoms aren't going anywhere. Now, what you've been used to writing is that the angular momentum is m r cross v. 
And that, you know, it's a, you know, you're not being taught any fibs. This is a perfectly valid way of representing it. And I should say, too, if, like, in the second half of the lecture, you think, oh, no, you know, we've done 18 lectures of, you know, well, in year one and 36 on Emo in year two, and we still haven't got there. Everything that I've said about the Maxwell equations in vector notation is true. All I'm going to tell you about is a more elegant way that was, uh, which is an important way of looking, particularly from the point of view of general relativity, is a more advanced way of looking at it. Likewise, in mechanics, you can definitely get the right answers from this. You know, you solve much harder problems in Lagrangian than this, and you can clearly get the angular momentum vector by taking the cross product of the position vector and the velocity vector, and again, multiplying by the scalar mass. Now, that seems to have the very weird result that if you're rotating in the xy plane, the only non-zero component of L is clearly the z component. And it seems, you know, intuitively very strange that if a disk is whirling round in the xy plane, that its angular momentum points along the z-axis. You think, no, the angular momentum has surely got to be in the xy plane. And indeed, it is. Because any cross product is an anti-symmetric second rank tensor. And so the true nature of angular momentum is that this thing is Lij, again these two subscripts, i and j are running over x, y and z, and the object that we're really considering is this tensor LXX, LXY, LXZ, LYX, LYY, LYZ, LZX, LZY, LZZ. But now, unlike with the polarizability tensor, the physics of the problem tells us this is an anti-symmetric tensor. And therefore, for an anti-symmetric tensor, well, just like we have this uh, property that if we've got a symmetric tensor, Tij that is equal to Tji, an anti-symmetric tensor, this is now an anti-symmetric second rank, still got these two components, anti-symmetric second rank three-dimensional tensor. So, it's an amazing accident, I don't know, perhaps you know, there's a deeper and anthropic principle underlying it all, but it seems to be a quite definite um, uh, accident of three dimensions. So, of course, the only way that Lij can equal minus Li, uh, uh, Lij is if it's zero. So the diagonal components of an anti-symmetric tensor have got to be naught. If, if, if LXX is equal to minus LXX, it's naught. So now we've got three zero components along the diagonal, and then these are equal and opposite in pairs. LYX I can change to minus LXY. LZX I can change, excuse me, LZX to minus LXZ. And similarly, LZY, I can change to minus LYZ. So this object, this, and as I say, the real, if you like, the deep physics of it, is that it is, it is an anti-symmetric second rank three-dimensional tensor. Ha it happens, this is this incredible accident in three-dimensional space, that LXY transforms like, if you look at its transformation properties, and it's, but it always with tensor components think how they transform under coordinate transformations, then this transforms like the z component of a vector. This transforms like the y component of a vector. And this transforms like the x component of the vector. So in 3D, an anti-symmetric tensor appears like a vector, and that's why it's often called a pseudo-vector or an axial vector, because it's not a real vector, but it behaves like one for most practical purposes. However, it's, you, you, you'll already be aware that if, for example, and indeed we are going to consider vectors which have got T, X, Y and Z components, 
that's a space-time vector, which we'll, we're coming to more in the second half of the lecture. And if such a tensor was anti-symmetric, there's the T, X, Y, Z here, well, we would have, for an anti-symmetric four-dimensional, it would still be anti-symmetric, it would still be second rank, but now we're going into the four dimensions of space-time. Such a vector, uh, such a tensor, if it was anti-symmetric, certainly, let's just call it F for the sake of argument, which is what I'm going to call it later on, I would have here F T X would certainly, I could replace the X T with minus F T X. Similarly, if I had F Ty, taking this one as the first component, I would here be able to put minus Fty. Here if I have Ftz, I mean it's pretty obvious now how I go on filling in the rest of the tensor, this would be minus Ftz. If I have here now Fxy, I can write here minus Fxy. If here I have F, you know, this, this component here, Xz, this would be minus F xz and here I've still got one more independent component fyz but here because of the anti-symmetry I have minus fyz and it's perfectly apparent that this has six independent components um, and if you're really thinking ahead on, on the game uh, and these will turn out to be the electric field and the magnetic field and this is precisely why uh, we can express um, electromagnetism in this field tensor way. But let's, uh, just, uh, so before I leave that, um, just to emphasise, I've written it, it you know, it apply, I, I did it for angular momentum but the same thing applies for a torque which is the cross product of the force um, and the position vector. So there are other examples of these anti-symmetric second rank 3D tensors and um, again to emphasise that although in 3D space we end up with these pseudo vectors that are perfectly adequate to describe them, it certainly cannot be possible in a four dimensional space time because the anti-symmetry still leaves us with six independent components which we certainly can't describe by another four vector. Well, there's six independent numbers there. So that is, if you like, my preamble on what tensors are, what an anti-symmetric tensor is, and <coughs> what the uh, general nature of, uh, of tensors is about. So I mentioned, again, these, these are effectively notes that are, are on the VLE. Um, it says, uh, by luck, however, there are we can represent these pseudo vectors and it just happens, only happens in three dimensions. And I've given this example that in four dimensions an anti-symmetric tensor of the second rank has six non-zero terms and can't be replaced by a four vector. And now, you know, of course, the punchline where we're getting on to the second part of the lecture, well, we do live in a four dimensional world, a space time with one time coordinate and three uh, space coordinates. So, um, oh, I've done the easy bit now. Yeah. We've got the slightly, uh, slightly harder bit to come. Okay, so I'm going to now switch. That had, if you, in a sense, nothing to do with electromagnetism. This was about tensors. I mean, I ch happened to choose an example about polarisation in electric fields to illustrate a 3D tensor. Um, because, again, I don't want you to think like all tensors are anti-symmetric. The polarisability tensor is symmetric and different tensors have yet other transformation properties depending on the physics. But we're certainly going to be interested particularly in this, this type of tensor. The answer, I'm gonna, it's a very strange thing, but I'm going to start, if you like, the second half with the answer and then prove that this is the case. So, the, um, the answer it looks like this. I think I might even have put it up at the end of the uh, little lecture on relativity, at the end of the... Um, uh, at the end of what is euphemistically called the spring term of January, February and March in York. Nobody likes that. Nobody ever calls a term a winter term. 
There's no so you only have spring, autumn, and summer in, in, in universities. Well, it's a nice world, isn't it? There's no winter in university. And then, so what I'm going to prove to you is that what appears to us in our slow-moving world is that there are two completely independent things, an electric field and a magnetic field. But, you know, we proved quite definitely, all we had to consider, I hope you remember it, of course, again, that's up on the, uh, on the, um, the VLA or YouTube. We did this whole idea that we had a current carrying wire and an electron that was moving parallel to it. And you, you know, the, Harry was keeping the space-time of the students for us, and, he, and, and he, he said, oh yeah, that's definitely a magnetic field, F is equal to QV cross B, and he got this perfect parabolic trajectory of the electron. I, being you know, an awkward bugger, a physics lecturer, said, no, 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 no. I'm, uh, I'm certainly not having that. I'm walking along at the same speed as the electron. The electron's at rest in my frame, and there's certainly no V cross B in my field frame because there's no V. I'm walking parallel to the electron all the time. But in my frame of reference there was an electric field. Seems and it is a strange concept at first because the charge density of the electrons and the, if you like, the iron cores in the wire now no longer balanced in my reference frame. The wire was uncharged in your reference frame but had a I wouldn't say charged, it had a net charge density in my reference frame, and the electron was, I saw the electron just fall vertically towards the wire. And because our times were also ticking differently, we got exactly, given, you know, Harry counting the seconds, Harry measuring the distances, he got the same trajectory as I got with my different, my shortened meter ruler and my slow down clock in the same amount of time that I was measuring as he was measuring we got the same change of momentum of the electron towards the wire again, you know, we'd be pretty worried if, if that wasn't the case now the, we took then a very very specific case to make it like, like almost algebraic if you like because we took, we said oh well let's let the electron that we very conveniently happen to be going on at exactly the same speed as the drift speed of the electrons in the wire and this very specific case we could solve in an almost qualitative algebraic way. This is the general solution of how the electric and magnetic field components would transform into each other and this is invariant under a Lorentz transform and what uh, Again, what, this is why I wanted to go to the answer first, is you see, if you've got an electric field, and you, you know, that is a perfectly good polar vector. EX, EY, EZ. That is my electric field. That is a nice polar vector. The, however, if I take time, if you like, out of the game, the time, remember, the, the electric field is, is, if you like, the time component. This is, the, you know, this is, as I've written it here, this is the FTX, FTY, FTZ. So if everybody's clock is just ticking at the same rate, like it is in Newtonian mechanics, well, it's just an ordinary 3D vector. No problem. Similarly, to emphasize, if I take time out of the game and I just consider x, y, there's our old friend, uh, well not an old friend, we were only introduced half an hour ago, there is our new friend, an anti-symmetric second rank tensor. There it is, zero on the, di the, the three diagonals, just like with the angular momentum vector, anti-symmetry, 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 and three independent components only. And in our slow-moving world where we've not mixed up, you know, we've not considered one coordinate system moving with respect to another, we just consider sort of like, if you like, rotations of the x, y, z coordinates, we have something that we can describe perfectly adequately as a polar vector three independent components. But the whole thing, the, the, the electromagnetic field, there is no possibility of thinking of these things separately. And that's what the specific example of lecture 27 was about. And if nothing else, 
it gives you the opportunity to use four hyphenated words, one after the other. And there aren't, no, there aren't many opportunities, I think, in English where you can say four hyphenated words, but, you know, you can say, oh, well, yes, uh, anti-symmetric, second rank, four-dimensional, space-time tensor. It's also particularly useful for scaring freshers. You kind of like, so, you know, you, you meet any freshers, you know, next year in a bar, beginning of term, you kind of think, oh, God, you know, it's really, you know, EM's really tough. It's all done in terms of this anti-symmetric, second rank, four-dimensional space-time tensor, and they all leave university. <laughs> oh, no, I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll bother with that. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I'm sure you're much too nice to scare the freshers. You know, when they arrive at Fizz Sock, you'll say, oh, don't worry, it's all just straightforward vectors. And anyway, anyway, that's where we're heading. Um, and, it, you know, it's obviously would be completely unsatisfactory for me to slap down a view graph and say that's the answer. So the next hour is about how we get there. Natural pause. Do you want to break for five minutes and, and, and then we'll go on, or shall I just bash on? Any preference? Bash on. Yeah, let's do it. Here we go. And again, I do want to uh, emphasise that I, you know I haven't told you any porkies in the course. It's perfectly okay to solve. You see, that's the nice thing about the Maxwell equations. Relativity was discovered from them. They are already. And this was, you know, the fundamental leap forward into physics in the early 20th century by Einstein. The equations of electromagnetism are already invariant under a Lorentz transform. So everything I've taught you about del dot products, uh, if you like, your del dots and your, de you know, your del curls, if you like, your divergences and curls, this is still a perfectly good way of representing classical physics. And again, you know, it's kind of like Einstein said, one of the, you know, the, the weirdest things about the universe is that it can be described at all by mathematics. These equations, which include conservation of charge, and of course we need the force law, um, are all we need to understand basically the whole of classical mechanics and electromagnetism. So this is, you know, a pretty powerful set of equations as I've uh, emphasised throughout. So I'm going to show you, it's not particularly easy, the proof, but um, I'm going to go through it, why those equations lead to the, the field tensor description. So, let's do it. Those are the four equations. We know what we've got to deal with. We've got to start somewhere, and let's start with del dot b is naught, basically, because it's the easiest one. Okay? So, this input, we know, you know, we've done this loads of times, you know, the divergence of a curl is zero. We're not going to, you know, reinvent the wheel in this lecture. You kind of students who turn up to a lecture uh, after, you know, the exam period, uh, and, you know, the ones who, who, who've assimilated that, and I'm sure you have. So, we can definitely write that b's the curl of something. This will guarantee that the divergence of B is equal to zero. We don't have to give that uh, any further thought. That's easy maths. We just write the components out, and we know we can express B in that way. So, we can now write Faraday's law. Again, I, I, I've used abbreviations. I'm using Maxwell 1 for uh, Gauss's law, uh, Maxwell 2 for Faraday's law, Maxwell 3 for this... Oh, sadly unnamed poor Maxwell 3 never got a name and Maxwell 4 is obviously the Ampere Maxwell law so um, so we can write Maxwell equation 2 as the curl of E is equal to minus dt of the curl of A which all we've done is say well B is the curl of A so obviously I can write it in and then I take the terms over to the other side, well clearly then the curl of, and remember again, we've had it so many times, the space and the time derivatives commute, so I can uh, perfectly well, um, <clears throat> if you like, take the curl first before the time derivative or vice versa, so I'm perfectly entitled to write that the curl of this thing here must equal naught. And this implies, again, we know this, this is very basic um, 
vector calculus that if something has a zero curl, we can express it as the gradient of something. Again, we just write out the components. We did that during the course. And let's call that something phi for the sake of argument because that's what we called it again in the course. And so now, immediately, we can describe E as putting this term back to this side, minus del phi minus dA by dt. And it, so this is, again, you know, emphasizing the points as we go along. To describe E and B, we need four potential functions. We need phi and A. Obviously, B is just equal to the curl of A. So, we, we, you know, once we've got A, we've got the B field. And, <coughs> oh, you know, its divergence is zero. And once we've got phi and A, we've got the E field. So you only need four potential functions to write down the Maxwell equations. And this precisely is because these things form a four vector. So if you have a vector which has these components in T, X, Y, and Z, one example of something that transforms like that is this so-called four vector composed of phi and a. And you, you know, exactly immediately begin to sort of smell a rat that, you know, we, we, there's something deeper going on because it appears to us that there are six independent components of the field and yet once we've written it in terms of phi and a, we seem to only have four independent components that we need to specify. So that's uh, taking it to stage one. You'll be pleased to hear that, these third, that those are the first two view graphs of about 15. But yeah, no, I hope everyone's with that um, at this stage. So, B is the curl of A and E is this minus the divergent. And of course it's a very, already it's a really beautiful way of doing things, you know, because clearly this is going to work for electrostatics, because in electrostatics nothing is changing as a function of time. And if the E field isn't generated by charges, but is generated by um, moving, uh, <coughs> you know, a charge density rho, but is generated by moving charges, well obviously putting these together we've got Faraday's law. So it's a beautiful way already of representing the Maxwell equations. And now, this, this is now going to be the slightly harder bit. This is now what's called a gauge theory. And you haven't yet studied the work of unification of electromagnetism and the weak force. And this got the, won the Nobel Prize in 1979 for the work of Weinberg and Salem. And it's still part, very much of fundamental physics, elementary particle physics, is to look for what are called gauge invariant quantities. And you choose a particular gauge to make your equations both elegant and work. The two kind of usually go together. So, and I mentioned, like, in a sense, let's just do, you know, electrostatics. I mean, it would be a bit fancy to call it a gauge if I just went, like, a gauge transformation. You know, that's, you know, because, you know, and I gave the example of a gravitational field. The gravitational force doesn't matter, you know, whether I choose the potential to be, you know, 10 zillion and 1 here and 10 zillion there, if the difference in potential is 1. Of course, I can arbitrarily add any scalar to phi because when I take its gradient I get nothing when I take the gradient of the constant. So the constant isn't physical. So I can clearly also immediately, it's immediately apparent that that's going to work, yeah? Because if I take the um, <coughs> excuse me, if I take the curl of this field, yeah? is clearly, well then, uh, I'm not going to change the magnetic field at all, yeah? Because if I take the curl of A prime, it's going to equal the curl of A plus the curl of a gradient. In other words, it's going to equal the curl of A because the curl of the gradient is nothing. So that clearly will work to the magnetic field. But now I have to be a bit careful because my electric field depends on both. 
So I have to, if I want to keep the same phi prime, I also have to shift phi by minus d, psi by dt, where this is the scalar field that I've added, whose gradient I've added in here. And then you can see that if I plot that into this equation here though well my phi prime well obviously if I take the gradient of that I get a minus del phi and if I take the gradient of that I get a <coughs> excuse me uh, uh, th th this term here and, and I get the div actually I think the proof is actually written below so let's go through the proof so the proof that that isn't changed well let's take E prime yeah well that is now equal to uh, minus del phi prime, now is these two terms, minus dA prime by dt, which is these two terms, and it is perfectly clear that these two terms which we've introduced because of this commutation of space and time cancel out, and I'm left with only these two terms which don't cancel out, but that was my original E field. So if I make this, this, this transformation here of these two things together, emphasised together, if I change them together by the rules, I've got a completely different four vector. My components of phi prime and A prime are quite different to the components of phi and A, but the physical E and B fields which I derive from them are identical. So I have, if you like, the freedom to make a gauge transformation of this four vector that will preserve the same fields. And as I say, the maths, it's only writing out four terms. It's, uh, of course, it's always hard to follow maths on view graphs, but as I say, it's all on the, the actual notes are on the VLE anyway. Well, so far, we've just taken the, the two Maxwell laws that don't relate to the sources. We just took del dot b is naught, and we took Faraday's law, well, let's write it as the curl of b minus db by dt, keep it in the, oops, you can hear Maxwell and Faraday turning in their graves, is there like that, but, uh, that's the correct form. Well, but now we want to relate the um, phi and a to the sources. So, we now have, uh, the mass does get a little bit hairier, but I'll just go through it, straight uh, through in, in the next sort of 10 minutes, this part. So, I now substitute in, we've got our expression for E is minus del phi minus dA by dt. Well, that's equal to rho over epsilon naught. That's Gauss's law. So I now write, of course, I can write this as minus del squared phi, and again, this old trick, swap over the space and time derivatives, d, d, d by dt of minus del uh, <coughs> dot a. That's just a straightforward manipulation. And now it's not immediately obvious that the correct gauge to choose, and this is called the Lorentz gauge, is that del dot a is equal to, make sure I get it right, minus 1 over c squared d phi by dt. This thing here is now called the Lorentz gauge. So, if I do that, then I can rewrite my equation, I can replace my del dot, because remember we, we are totally free to choose a, provided we make that simultaneous transformation as phi, because we're going to produce the same E and B fields. I can make, I can choose how to shift this four vector um, and maintain the same, because we're, we're going to measure the physical E and B fields. So if I change the mathematical machinery that produces the same E and B fields, I'm allowed to do that. And this is the particular choice. You actually, you'll remember that in magnetostatics, uh, we particularly make that choice of gauge. That, for ma that reduces the equations of magnetostatics. To th so you remember we got three equations for AX, AY, and AZ that re resembled Poisson's equation of electrostatics, so that we could solve magnetostatic problems by mapping onto electrostatic problems. Because at the end, we had to do the electrostatic type problem, the Poisson's equation type problem, three times to get AX, AY, and AZ, then take the curl at the end. 
So it is, but this is not a good choice, absolutely not a good choice for electrodynamics. That is, that, that is a purely convenience for magnetostatics and emphasizes, we know, we can choose a different gauge for different types of problems. So then um, what you get is this equation because now if I put in the, and, and Lorentz was a clever bloke you know to see that this was uh, you know the way to go uh, see it's, e it's easier to look back and say oh yeah I can see that works it's of course when you're looking at these problems for the first time and solving them um, you have to be incredible at maths but now you can see that if I've got the make the, the, the substitution I get this equation and I, I, I very much I'm sure you will recognize it because um, uh, people did rather good derivations of the free space Maxwell equations in the exam. If this is naught, if I'm in free space, there's our old friend, the three-dimensional weight. Uh, this is a wave equation for phi. So we proved in the lectures, semi-qualitatively and mathematically, that E and B fields must obey wave equations. We've now come at it from a completely different angle, which is that if I'm far away from any sources of charge density, I've immediately, by this formalism, got a wave equation. But note that I would only get that wave equation in that particular Lorentz gauge. It's only if I choose the divergence of A to be precisely minus 1 over C squared d phi by dt that this becomes a three-dimensional wave equation. Now, there is a general method for solving this equation called the Leonard Vickert potentials that were actually discovered before relativity that is very difficult and was part of the fourth year EM theory course, which is why in our course we just set this equal to naught from the outset. We never investigated this because this equation has got both wave-like and close to the source like solutions and when you solve it when you're very close to the source it's dominated by the charge density by a kind of coulombic field when you're far from the source it's, it's dominated by the wave like solutions that we looked at in the intermediate regime it's what's called a bloody difficult equation to solve anyway we'll leave that to the mathematicians and move on so We've now got, you think, oh, well, wow, things are going swimming, swimmingly now. This is great. We've got, the, um, we've, got, we, we, we've got the right equation for the potential. It's going to be a doddle to do the same for the magnetic field. Um, and it isn't. Here we go. Now we want to relate the magnetic field to the source with the Ampere-Maxwell law. Yeah? So we've, done, we've, we've related the phi, if you like, to the source with the... Um, <laughs> excuse me, with the, uh, with the Gauss's law, we've still got the, and now this is our last piece, we've already put in three of the four Maxwell equations, so the last piece becomes C squared, curl of the curl of A, minus D by DT, and we sub in here for our E, is J over epsilon naught. And again, some, a manipulation that everyone's familiar with, we can certainly re-express the curl of the curl, as the gradient of the divergence minus the Laplacian applied to the A field, and we get this. Oh, God. Yeah. Doesn't look very nice, really, does it? Oh, God. It's not very simple, but... Da, 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 da. We are free to choose arbitrarily the divergence of A. And this is where, again, this is this this crucial step of this choice of the Lorentz gauge and, this, and, 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 and it is believed, we don't know, it is believed that the, as far as we know that the Lorentz gauge underlies the lot, the weak force, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force. So the, if you like, it's, saying, it's the same as saying that things are relativistically invariant or that all nature obeys Lorentz transforms. Now, it might not be true. It's only true as far as we know. So what we do is, again, what we mean by this choice is, is that we can always add some scalar, the gradient of some scalar field to A and get the same A prime. Um, if you do that, you get that the divergence, though, 
So, you know, we're perfectly free to do that and get the same B field, but then the divergence of A prime is not the same as the divergence of A because we've added the Laplacian applied to this scalar field. And if you make this choice, and this is, if you like, so I say there's a whole thing on the VLE on gauge theory. Uh, this is called choosing a gauge. This, this very important equation and changing A by adding this gradient of a scalar field which is it's conceptually it's not much harder than this one it's just less familiar but you can shift the constant to a scalar field well you can you know you can add this gradient of a scalar field to this vector field and then you're working in the Lorentz gauge so that I think is the hard bit if you've got on top of that we can sail downhill for another eight or nine view graphs. So, that hor you see now in this Lorentz gauge, that horrible expression that we got from the Ampere-Maxwell law where we had these four, you know, like really messy looking terms and it's not obvious what's going on, is that the, now the two middle terms cancel out because the divergence here, well this minus one over c squared cancels this c squared, and then I've got my minus d phi by dt here, it cancels this d by dt of del phi, so these two terms disappear. So in the Lorentz gauge, the a, all the components of the A field also are expressed very simply, and of course again in free space, where there is no current density, that becomes naught, and we've got a three-dimensional wave equation for the vector potential. So, you know, I like, I'm trying to make connections with things that are familiar that we've done on the course, is that if we take this to be naught, we've now got a very, very beautiful wave equation for phi and A. So, we've already proved by this pure mathematical method that phi and A must obey a, three a, 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 a wave equation if we have got far from the sources, but we've now got a more general equation which also relates it to the sources. So we've now got this, and again, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I copied this down from Maxwell, uh, sorry, not from Maxwell, from Feynman. When Feynman gets this far, he just, yeah, that's his comment. What a beautiful set of equations, because it's so simple. And this is now, you can see, the phi and the a, we could think of as a four vector, phi, ax, ay, az, and then this side is a four vector, rho, jx, jy, jz. So the potentials are transforming in this way. Let me just we'll get rid of the Lorentz gauge here. And likewise, the sources transform in this way too. And they transform in this very specific way, which is of course called the Lorentz transform, which you know you studied uh, in you know, first year special relativity with John. So these are four vectors, all examples of four vectors. This is called the four potential of electromagnetism. This is the source. This is, as if you like, a generalized current density, where this is the time component of the current density. And they transform in this, all into each other in this same particular way, which is indeed precisely now you're seeing how, it, this is how Lorentz discovered the, uh, the Lorentz transformation. So, just to emphasize too, you know, this is in passing, but it's a, a, a link with what we've done before. You can see in free space, it's immediately apparent that both phi and A satisfy a three-dimensional wave equation, and it therefore follows that E and B satisfy the, uh, a three-dimensional wave equation, and we've already done it by direct proof. So at least we've got a nice link-up point there. So the, what Lorentz was, look, was looking at was that, I mentioned these two, I think they might have been Austrian scientists, Leonard and Wieke, discovered how to solve these equations, and the method is not surprisingly called uh, the method of uh, Leonard and Wieckert. And 
Again, it wasn't like a complete accident that um, I just studied that case of a, of a charge moving with uniform velocity in a straight line because that's what Lorentz did. And he discovered, again, this is, you know, if you like, pure mass. And that step to that step is not trivial. No, it took a brilliant mathematician to realise that that's the correct transformation. Again, it's easier for us now to go the other way round because we can plug the Lorentz transformation in and we can show that it works. Um, but that again is, if you like, pure math. So what he actually discovered was that phi prime was expressed in terms of phi and a and, and, and <coughs> yeah, sorry, jx prime, jy prime, jz prime, and phi prime transformed in this way with respect to jx, jy, jz, and phi, because he was solving the Leonard Vickert equations for phi and a, and he realised that again, you know, I've stressed this all along, tensors behave in a particular way under coordinate transformations, that if you had uniform motion of a velocity u along the z-axis, the coordinates would transform in this way. Now, so that general EM field tensor, you've got both rotations in 3D space and then these translations along one of the axes. Now, of course, the translation could be along any of the axes, and then all the tensor components jumble up in a horrible way. So what's usually done is you reorient your... You know, let's say we, we, we redid that, 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 that particle just drifting along next to the wire. You might think, oh, you know, Martin chose the x-axis for that way. Uh, I'd much rather I chose my x-axis, you know, pointing into the top corner of the room. Now, the way you'd handle it would be to first do your spatial rotation so that because you can then always choose by your 3D rotation matrix to put your line along the x-axis. You can always twiddle your axes around. It doesn't matter whether I've chosen my original x-axis there, there, down there. I can always do a 3D rotation and say, oh, that's the new x-axis. And then I do a Lorentz transformation between x prime, t prime, and x t to get my length and time with this uniform translation. The full field tensor has both got this built into it, this transform with respect to uniform motion along the x-axis, and the rotations in xyz space. But, you know, the easiest way to do it is just make your translation direction the x-axis first, and then do a Lorentz transform, and that works perfectly well. A little bit of first year maths just sneaked it in unsuspectedly. Just when you thought it was getting difficult, lobbed in a slow underarm ball. Don't forget that one of the crucial properties, which I mentioned at the beginning, of the 3D transformation aspect is that we sure as hell better keep the distance between two points the same. Well, obviously that's not the case under the Lorentz transform. You know, you, but, uh, yeah, you've only got to go back uh, one slide and see, well, you know, let's just take this one, which happens to be uniform translation along the, the axis of, of x. Well, if I square x squared plus y squared plus z squared, these obviously cancel, and this x squared is obviously not equal to it. This x prime squared is not equal to this x squared. So, of course, I have a different distance between two points. You know, my ruler's contracted in one of the dimensions. You know, I'm not going to measure the same distance as you if I'm moving relative to you. Um, but you must... Um, find out, and again, it's now just algebra. We've got, in 3D, you have to preserve this. In 4D, you have to preserve this. So this is the generalization, if you like, of Pythagoras' theory to four dimensions. And it's emphatically not true to say, oh, Einstein discovered that time is just like another dimension of space. If he discovered that, this would have a plus sign. All right, I might also measure it. You might measure, you might be going one second, one second, and I might be going three times 10 to the eight meters, three times 10 to the eight meters, three times 10 to the eight meters. But it's not just a different scale, it's a different geometry, the Lorentz transform. And this, you could say, oh no, what, what happens if I go 
to a prime coordinate system which includes all these rotations in x, y, z but also includes the Lorentz transform crucially this is not c prime squared precisely the point c is measured to be the same by every observer this is certainly not a prime on this t prime squared and s prime squared is equal to s squared so again, like when Harry was keeping your space time and I was keeping my space time, we were both perfectly entitled to it and we wouldn't have agreed on the distances between two different points in the room. We wouldn't have agreed uh, that our clocks were ticking at the same rate, but we would have certainly agreed on what's called the interval between two events in space time is the same. That, and, and this is what's called the scalar invariant in 4D space-time, and we've got to preserve that, and the Lorentz transform does. I mean, you know, again, you're very straightforward to square these quantities, and then when you do, you get the sum of the same quantity squared on the other side in the unprimed coordinate system. So, that's um, all of the preamble. We can now really hit the target. So we call any quantity that behaves like an ordinary three-dimensional vector for rotations but obeys the Lorentz transform for translations a four-vector. That's what we call it. It's called a four-vector. And as I said, we've got in electromagnetism two crucial four-vectors, the four-vector of the potentials and the four-vector of the sources. And um, just like for 3D vectors, there's a scalar invariant and let's think of that as the dot product of a vector with itself. That's obviously the scalar invariant just by 3D Pythagoras theorem. For 4D vectors, this is the scalar invariant. Note the minus sign, space and time are different. You know, it's the kind of pub talk where Einstein just showed that time's another kind of space. Well, he quite emphatically didn't. Um, and, you know, the, the Lorentz transform that looks extremely different and I think somewhere in here I hope so I've actually got a picture of what that looks like but first it's a bit weird to get your head round because we get so used to these rotations in the XY plane like I said that little thing with Irene when you have you know case theta sine theta minus sine theta case theta 2 by 2 matrix to represent this well of course if you start off with a Cartesian coordinate system and you rotate it in a rigid way, you end up with another Cartesian coordinate system. You've just turned it. However, the space and time axes actually kind of like open and close like a pair of scissors when you make the, the Lorentz transform. And that's harder for us to get our head round because we're measuring along one axis with a clock and the other axis with a ruler. But at a deep level, we know this underlies all of the laws of physics, so it's quite worth trying to get your head round, that as you move your coordinate system, the observer's relative time and space axes move closer and closer together. And indeed, when their relative velocity approaches the speed of light, these two axes coincide. For a photon, time absolutely doesn't pass. Photon is the same as it was when it was created. It will always be the same. You've only got to look at the denominator of the Lorentz transform to see that that is true. If u is equal to c, 1 minus u squared over c squared is naught. Time simply doesn't pass for a photon. And again, we find that, like these are things because we, are, we live in a slope. We you know we're about a meter long, and our pulse ticks at about once a second. You know, we try and measure the universe relative to ourselves with more sophisticated ways now than holding our arms out and saying, "Oh, that's a yard," or counting our pulse and saying, "That's a second." But we're kind of trying to measure things relative to ourselves, and so we find it very hard to imagine perhaps this transformation. Or as I say in particular, I think it came up in one of my tutorials, you've got a, you know, a light bulb and a photon heads off at C in that direction, and relative to me it's going at C, and another photon heads off at C in that direction, and relative to me it's going at C, and the relative velocity of those two photons is C. And this is, you know, it's a, 
physics was never meant to be an easy subject conceptually and uh, yeah, but this is the fact that it behaves like this and you'll often see because we can't think in 4D because now according to the principle of relativity you cannot move faster than the speed of light this now places a, a severe restriction on what we know about the universe what people normally do is they say well we the, the, the y axis is perpendicular to the plane of this and the z axis is perpendicular to the plane of this somehow in a kind of curly way but it's you know we've got four orthogonal cartesian axes of x y z and t the way we normally represent it is to say well let's just choose one of the other axes and kind of row imagine we've now got the y axis imagining in 4d is quite hard let's just take uh, if you like x y and t and we rotate around that then this thing becomes called the light cone and the, if you sort of similarly go uh, backwards in, in, along the time axis you have what's called the backlight cone and because no particle can travel faster at the speed of light we can only be influenced by any space time points within our back time cone and this is therefore called the absolute past because it can causally influence us but we can't causally influence it likewise this is the absolute future because I can't send a, single, a signal anywhere or a material part, point anywhere at faster than the speed of light so I can only reach space time events or points like that and this is called the absolute future and all this bit is called the absolute elsewhere well, we can never know, can we? It's like saying, what's going on in Alpha Centauri now? Well, moot point, isn't it? We, ne we could never know. We've got to wait for a light signal to arrive. So we, you know, we don't know what's going on there now, in inverted commas. We can certainly know what's going on there in N light years' time, where N is the... Um, so, sorry, in N years, where N is the number of light years away. So I'm not saying that, you know, it's conceptually easy, but the maths is, 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 is not too horrific. What people have always found difficult throughout the 20th century is having this model, but also our sense of time progressing. And hey, we're doing third year thermodynamics together in the autumn, so uh, we'll give time an arrow with entropy when we do that. But all the laws of physics you've studied so far are time reversal invariant. If you change classical mechanics, you change t to minus t everywhere. You do it in classical electromagnetism, t to minus t everywhere. Now it's a moot point, and an interesting one with the Schrodinger equation, because um, you know you study that a lot with Christian this year. Incidentally, that exam went okay too, so nice one. Let's <coughs> put in the constant is equal to, and then we want let's say the energy operator on this this side, a h bar d by d t. Well, these are second-order partial derivatives with respect to space, and this is a first-order partial derivative with respect to time. So the Schrodinger equation is not relativistically invariant. You might say, oh no, there's something wrong with electromagnetism, but it's not. There's something wrong with quantum mechanics. And in particular, no, 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 the Dirac, the Dirac equation, the relativistically invariant quantum mechanical equation is completely true as far as we know but it's very difficult to teach because you're doing all the difficulties of what you're doing with Christian and this stuff at the same time Dirac also tried to write down a transformation of Schrodinger type equation that was invariant under general relativistic transformations and I, he did that in 1930 and I don't think anyone's got their head around this paper yet you know like, uh, nearly a century later but he did write down an equation that was relativistically invariant under this Lorentz transform. We're still in a flat space time. Time's got a different geometry in the transformations, but it's still, if you like, at right angles to the other three axes. It's like a, a weird sort of 4D Cartesian space. Whereas general relativity, you have 
a curved space as well. The axes don't remain. In fact, in fact parallel in Riemannian geometry, parallel lines meet at infinity, and in Lobachevskian geometry, they diverge at infinity. And a lot of this stuff you hear about the cosmological constant, all these arguments that are going around at the moment with dark energy, dark matter, they're all to do with interpretations of these kind of field equations, but uh, that's going a bit off the topic. So, uh, as I tend to do, as I'm sure you're aware. Okay, let's, let's go back to the straightforward development. So, originally, and I, I still quite like this formalism because it, it sort of like makes it a bit weird that the time axis has got an imaginary in it. But this is a very nice way of preserving the scalar invariant is to write four vectors as x, y, i, c, t. Because if you take the dot product of that with itself, of course you get x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c squared t squared. Um, and I, I actually think there's a lot of merit in that, but uh, I quite like it. I mean, that was a 1908 paper when Minkowski was looking at the, the idea of the light cone and the representation of the Lorentz contraction as this kind of opening and closing of a pair of scissors was, was due to Minkowski. Um, but what is that? Uh, the very, I mean, you, you know, you probably won't be doing this professionally for a while, so don't worry. But the modern convention is usually to write four vectors, as I've done it um, in this way here, <coughs> with the time component first, and then x, y, z. You choose c equals to one. In other words, well, you can look at that either way. You can say I'm going to choose my unit along the time axis as be three times ten to the eight meters. Or change my you know, measurement of, 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 the, of the space axis to seconds. The more usual is to think, well, let's let C equal to 1, and at the end of the calculation, put it back in. So I don't, you don't even know what to call it. What is the position vector in space? It, it's a space-time instant. You know, it's, a, it's a position, in, but it's a position at a particular time. So a space-time instant we, we, uh, is for a general four vector. So in other words, these... Um, would be examples. So, um, in this convention, C is 1, and it's understood, you don't write in any minus sign, you just understand that if I dot that with itself, I get AT squared minus AX squared minus. Also, no, you know, in the modern, it's typical, you know, conventions change. Um, the idea of writing it this way round is it's more natural when you consider t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. This gives you an int... When you take the square root of that quantity, if it's positive, you're in the absolute... Excuse me, absolute future. If it's negative, you're in the absolute past. Oh, let me get that right. <coughs> Cut. Deliberate mistake. <laughs> Uh, so an hour and a half in. So uh, if you have, uh, go back to this idea here, it's nice to think, if you're in the absolute elsewhere, it really is called the absolute elsewhere. It's quite ridiculous and, you know, it's why people, you know, why all our colleagues in other departments think we're bonkers, you know, oh, yeah. oh yeah, we're calculating this space-time uh, to the absolute elsewhere. Uh, but in this region, out here in the absolute elsewhere, we like to think of S as imaginary. Because if you like the distance to the point, you know, you can never get there. Whereas if you, so if you choose it in this way around, the t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared way, then you have the, um, this is reachable. When you take the square root of this quantity, it's real. And of course, it can be real positive or real negative. So, um, whereas if you take it this way, x squared plus y squared plus c squared minus c squared t squared, your s to the absolute elsewhere is real, and your s to the real world, either the past or the future, is imaginary. And so, it, you know, it kind of uh, it, it has got superseded. But anyway, those are, are minor points. So. We've got a general four vector. We've got two examples of it up on the board. How about, well, we obviously, if we're going to think in four dimensions, we're going to have to generalise quite a lot of things. And the first thing you need to generalise is the 
Dell operator. And again, it's usually written in this form. There's, there's some confusing sign conventions, but we'll brush over them. It's usually written specifically with d by dt, then minus d by dx, minus d by dy, minus d by dz. So we can define a four-dimensional gradient operator. So this is the equivalent in space-time to our gradient operator in three-dimensional space. Well, obviously, if we've got that, we can take the scalar product of it with itself. Remember, throughout this, from now on, c is equal to 1. Yeah, that's understood now. We can always put it back in the end, because wherever we see a t in the final answer, we can call, you know, sort of say, OK, well, let's call it ct. Let's go back. It's just to make the equations look more pretty and symmetrical, c set equal to 1 during the calculation. Well, obviously, now all I've done is, is take the dot of that with itself, and obviously I can uh, <coughs> abbreviate it back in this way. So if I've done that, that is the four-dimensional analogue of the three-dimensional Laplacian operator, and it's called the D'Alembertian. And it has, it's really nice, isn't it? Well, this is in 3D, and it's a little triangle, and this is in 4D, so it's a little square-squared, the D'Alembertian. It's a, a square-squared. So this is the compact notation for taking del mu dot del mu, where del mu is defined as the four-dimensional gradient, and it just gives us, uh, a, you know, a very obvious expression. Now, of course, I'm not going to go through the whole of the analogy between three and four-dimensional vector calculus, but just to, you know, point you up in the right sort of direction, you, you know, everyone's totally used, there's my, whoops, of course, you know, it's copied from a book. There's my 3D vector. Well, now I've got a 4 vector. I put the time component first, and I could, if I like, abbreviate it to the time component, and then the ordinary 3D vector in bold notation. It's obvious how one should extend the scalar product. We just did it, in effect. And so, in general, A mu B mu is now A T B T minus A X B X minus A Y B Y minus A Z B Z, or I could abbreviate it to A T minus the scalar product we've got used to. We've already done this with the <coughs> the vector operator. Uh, clearly, we've done it already with the gradient. Now, the divergence is an interesting one because the divergence we have now got a D A t by dt plus the del a we'll be using that in a minute but it, you know it, it, I think once you've got the hang of four vectors that generalizing from 3d vectors which you're very good at already to 4d vectors it might be conceptually hard work but certainly the maths you've just got one extra component and a sign convention to remember and it's not harder than that and then finally because of its very special role the four-dimensional kind of Laplacian is called the, the Lombertian <coughs> so that's how it's generalized Ooh, I've already got had that one um, and now It is a long calculation. I say everyone's like, oh god, let's go for lunch. This was a mistake coming to this after term lecture. Uh, so we can now write, you see, with this four dimensional, uh, we can abbreviate this operator. Now remember, c is equal to 1 in this notation now, where we go over to this one. We've got the de Lombertian applied to phi, gives us rho over epsilon naught, and the de Lombertian applied to a gives us j over epsilon naught. So that's a really neat compact way of writing the Maxwell equations, but things get even neater because these four quantities transform as a four vector and these four quantities transform as a four vector. As I said, historically, it was the discovery that these four quantities transform as a four vector that actually led to the idea of the Lorentz transform in the first place. So if I write those as a four vector, I've put them. I've written them out again. There, the de Lambertian applied to this, giving these two, can be a, a combined to this one equation. Now that equation, squared squared, the de Lambertian applied to the four vector of the potential phi a x a y a z is equal to the four current rho j x j y j z over epsilon naught. So we have now got the Maxwell. So I say it's not like 
you know, writing it out as the four separate vector equations is perfectly okay and get the right answers. There's not, not a problem there. But this, if you like, exhibits the Maxwell equations in, their, in a sense in their full beauty of this unity of space-time because we built in the Lorentz transform to our entire theory of electrodynamics and the four Maxwell equations look incredibly beautiful in this notation. Now to solve a practical problem we might have to re-unpack them and solve the electric and magnetic fields Simil, you know, in, 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 in a more crude way, but this is a very, very nice way. And indeed, Maxwell used it's totally fallen into disrepute in, this, in the 20th century because um, it, you know there are some other complications. He used the quaternions, which are a kind of generalisation of complex numbers, to express things, and um, in a sense. The four-dimensionality of space-time is very is most elegantly expressed. But again, remember, we only got that set of equations when we chose this Lorentz gauge. We had to make a particular choice for del dot a, and we made it defy by dt. But now look at the Lorentz gauge in this notation. This is the four-dimensional Laplacian, sorry, not Laplacian, excuse me, gradient operator, contracted, remember the, the, the summation convention for tensors, uh, with the four potential is nor. So the Lorentz gauge, which uh, I, I, in four vector notation looks like this, and the max, all four Maxwell equations look like that. Elegant or what? <laughs> no, it's hard work, but it's a very, I think, you know, the end point is, is a very beautiful one. You say, well, you haven't reached the end point yet, Martin. This is all about the potentials. How about the fields? What happens to that electromagnetic field tensor view graph you slapped down half an hour ago? You know, you're going to leave us unsatisfied by not doing that. Well, of course I'm not. What about the fields? Well, let's write out B uh, cross A. And let's use precisely this notation that we will call, well, we know that Bx, this is just the definition of Bx in terms of the vector potential, but if I'm using that four vector notation, and you can see, as I say, the four equations are really, you know, rather beautifully compacted by it, and the Lorentz gauge itself has got a very beautiful, simple interpretation, well, interpretation equation, um, then if you like, again, this is, it's, you know, like when I was thinking about the magnetic field analogy with the uh, angular momentum this is an a this is a, a yz thing d by dy applied to az minus d by dz applied to by y and it is precisely if we use this notation <coughs> of having um, the, the the definition of the uh, of the Lorentz gauge in this way bx by and bz we can have, we all I've done, I mean, I'm not being, you know, funny here, but all I've did is just given more logical labels to them. Well, this is a kind of ZY thing, isn't it? And this is a kind of XZ thing. Now, what happens if you try and concoct a T-type thing in this way? And we're now coming, finally, to the general, uh, it was left off my view graph, because it's, the last step, if you like, of, is um, the four-dimensional the four analogue of a cross product. So, and you, you've seen that like, in 3D, the cross product's a bit of a tricky little animal. So, we'll, but it's actually more elegant than 4D. Well, what if we do take that? Let's say, well, it's pretty obvious that BX should be represented as some ZY thing. What happens if we take some TZ type thing? Well, let's do it. Let's just take the TZ thing. Let's different. But remember, the, the time component of the four vector is rho, and these are the and the Z component is the Z component of the ordinary vector potential. So, <coughs> again, this is where the yeah this these awful sign conventions because space and time are different so we've got to choose some kind of convention to deal with that because the t derivative comes with opposite sign to the x y and z derivatives this actually when we make a tz thing if we want to write it in gradient type notation we have to take a minus sign with this 
d by dt as well. So the t component is now dat by dz minus daz by dt. Yeah? But, that, but we know that at is just phi, and we know that az is the normal z component of the vector potential. So that answer here is just the z component of e is equal to minus del phi minus da by dt. So I can clearly, if I take a tz type combination, I clearly end up with this result that I have got the z component of the electric field. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through it with the other components. You know, you can see clearly it will work. So this, I hope, proves. Don't worry, we have only. We've, this is the last, the last one. We're nearly there. I'll go back to um, the beginning in a, in, in a moment. So similarly, you've got ftz is ez, and you've got fty is ey, ftx is ex. And obviously, if you take FTT or FXX, you're taking a kind of cross, you're taking something minus itself. So they all go equal to zero. So in general, F nu mu is minus F mu mu. This is the anti-symmetry property. Everything's consistent with the four vector notation. If you define F nu mu as equal to del mu, a nu minus del nu a mu and that is the generalization of the cross product into four dimensions so if you like the electromagnetic field tensor is the a cross product of two four vectors in four dimensions and this f nu mu is called the electromagnetic field tensor now i know it's hard to follow, we're probably all a bit short on energy just before lunchtime, but I hope I've given you at least an outline. As I say, I've tried to compact a lot of what's on the VLE and give you, you know, half of Richard's fourth year EM theory course that was discontinued a couple of years ago in an hour, so you're probably feeling a bit kind of like, was that a Del Mu and Mu Mu? Probably a bit kind of like gone a bit weird at this stage. But I hope that you've got a feeling that in the end, if you take this final generalized cross product and you, so this is your four dimensional uh, gradient operator, the d by dt minus d by dx minus d by dy minus d by dz and apply it to this four potential where this is the time component of the four potential the cross product of those two things and this is what this is why in a sense You've got six independent components of the um, uh, electric and magnetic fields, even though you've only got apparently four independent components of the potential. And then, yeah, as I say, to go back to the beginning, because we, you know, we, you know, we, our pulses tick once a second almost by definition, and you know, we measure things roughly the length of our arm span. You know, it's about a metre. In our slow-moving world, this totally separates from this and we see this polar vector that we call the electric field and because of that separation we then see this axial vector or anti-symmetric three-dimensional di tensor. So anyway, um, enjoy. No, don't, you know, you know, don't, don't, don't really go and tell all the first years. Oh, mine does the whole of the second year course in terms of these field tensors. Uh, uh, anyway, um, well done for coming in. I'm really I thought there'd be nobody around today, and you know, I, was, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see. I see. If I don't see you before, have a nice summer, and you know, reread a bit of that first year thermodynamics that you've forgotten before we meet again. <laughs> <laughs>